We're about to start the show. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our virtual Yellowstone event and uh, introduce myself. I'm Lisa Diekman, the president and CEO of Yellowstone Forever. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, since you're with us, you probably know uh, that Yellowstone Forever is the official nonprofit partner for Yellowstone National Park. Our mission is to protect, preserve, and enhance Yellowstone through education and philanthropy. We offer educational programs and experiences through our Yellowstone Forever Institute and educational materials, materials through our stores in park visitor centers. And with the generous support of members like you, we fund a variety of projects identified by Yellowstone as park priorities. And this includes the Bison Conservation and Transfer Program, which is the focus of tonight's virtual Yellowstone. So thank you for joining us from across the country and the world for your support of Yellowstone. I know people are still jumping on, but we are expecting people on the call tonight from Germany, the Netherlands, France, Ireland, and Puerto Rico as well as Anchorage, Alaska, Bozeman, Montana, and Miami, Florida, as well as 400 cities and towns in between. This is our first virtual event, and we look forward to hosting more in the future and bringing more of Yellowstone to you. I also want to thank Canon USA for sponsoring this event tonight. Canon USA has been a steadfast corporate champion of Yellowstone for 24 years, funding important park projects like the iconic wolf program, native bird research, cougar monitoring and research, and valuable climate change studies to highlight just a few. So thank you Canon USA for your partnership. We're also very excited to partner with Yellowstone National Park and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition to support the Bison Conservation and Transfer Program, which as I said, is the focus of tonight's event. Tonight, we're also fortunate to have Superintendent Cam Shawley and lead bison biologist, Chris Jeremiah with us. We will hear from them why this project is so important for wildlife conservation in Yellowstone and why your support matters. One brief but very important housekeeping matter. Please think of your questions as Chris gives his presentation, but do not put them in the chat box until after Chris has finished sharing his screen and after his presentation. If you put it in there during his presentation, we won't be able to capture them and answer your questions after his presentation. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, Cam Shawley, who will tell us a little bit more about the Bison Conservation and Transfer Program. Again, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Good uh, evening, everyone uh, across the country. And it sounds like globally, we're extremely pleased that you're here with us tonight. Uh, it's a very important topic to us. I wanna thank Yellowstone forever uh, and Lisa and the great team at, at YF for helping to, to host this and uh, <clears throat> helping to facilitate uh, such an important dialogue. You know, we have a, as all of you know, I think a tremendous number of um, conservation priorities occurring in Yellowstone as we continue to work together to strengthen the Yellowstone ecosystem. And that's not just the actions that we take uh, within the boundary of Yellowstone, but uh, how important it is uh, that the actions that we take also are understood that they affect everything that happens outside the boundary of Yellowstone and vice versa. Uh, Yellowstone National Park, I think in all of my assignments in the National Park System has got one of the most tremendous teams you're gonna hear, as Lisa said, from Chris Jeremiah here shortly. Uh, he's uh, got a comprehensive grasp on the importance of of Bison to Yellowstone and uh, has done a tremendous job with the team in Yellowstone of, of taking that program from a fledgling level and building it into something very special that we can all be very proud of. Uh, we don't do anything alone in Yellowstone. We rely not only on incredible partnerships like Yellowstone Forever, but also 
uh, as, as Lisa said, that Greater Yellowstone uh, Coalition, Wildlife Conservation Network, a huge other, a huge range of other partners that help us achieve uh, the many priorities that we're working on. The 150th anniversary of Yellowstone is next year, as a reminder, and uh, I think that's a really powerful point in time for all of us to not only reflect on on Yellowstone uh, over the past 150 years and, and before that, but also to think about, um, most importantly, what the next 150 looks like. And uh, that's a very important thing for us to focus on. Uh, tonight, I think you're gonna be inspired by some of the progress that you're gonna see in the, in the bison program in Yellowstone. Remember that even with national park protection, you know, 100 years ago, we were um, killing predators in Yellowstone, we were killing wolves, we were killing grizzlies, we were killing bison uh, as well. And uh, we were feeding bears out of cars 50 years ago. Uh, and we've done a very good job together uh, at putting the pieces back at this ecosystem. And it's very, very important that we continue to make progress in that uh, and lay out what priorities and actions that we're gonna take over the upcoming 150 years to uh, continue that progress. Um, today we're talking bison and uh, you know my, my special thanks to my predecessor, Dan Wank, who did a, an excellent job in a very complicated issue of trying to uh, give us more options uh, to manage bison and reduce the number of bison that we consign to slaughter every year. Uh, as we'll talk about in detail here with Chris, um, you know, bison are the only species that we constrain in Yellowstone. Most of that is because of uh, social and, and political uh, tolerance or intolerance. Uh, those are things that we want to shift over time. Uh, I have a, a goal with the team, with Chris, of ultimately eliminating bison being consigned to slaughter. Uh, we can only do that over time, um, paying attention to, you know, factors like brucellosis, uh, paying attention to, you know, a variety of other different things that we'll talk about. Um, but we need support uh, with the state, with the tribes, with our partners um, to actually execute on some of these priorities. And what you're gonna hear about tonight is what was a fledgling program called the Quarantine Program several years ago, which pulls bison into a, a, uh, a, a protocol that uh, kind of clears them of brucellosis and allows us to transfer them onto larger landscapes. That's a very important component to managing bison. And um, we are excited to expand that and do that in partnership with Yellowstone Forever and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. And uh, we'll talk some more and look forward to your questions after Chris's presentation. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Alrighty, well, um, well, thank you all. Thank you for the, the nice introduction. Thank you for the invite tonight. Gosh, I've been here 20 years working with bison in the park. And uh, it's been an interesting journey. Now, I, I've had this, this, the amazing opportunity to go out into the park and to, to see what bison, wild bison are like, to see landscape where you just see black dots as far as the, the eye can see. And it, you know, it gives me great pause. Once upon a time, 30 to 60 million bison roamed across North America. And that wasn't very long ago, maybe 200 years. And in the blink of time, they were all gone, 200 to 400 animals, you know, scattered, you know, across, you know, what used to be millions and tens of millions of bison. You know, of those, 20 animals made their last stand here in Yellowstone down by, down by the lake. And the Park Service made a decision in 1901 that uh, that wasn't enough, that we wanted to bring back this species that, uh, you know, once roamed the entire continent. We brought 21 animals into the Buffalo Ranch. We constructed that ranch in the Lamar Valley. We, you know, burned the plants that were there. We planted hay. We dug irrigation ditches. We built corrals more so than anything. And we kept the bison in there and we helped them grow. And those animals that, you know, they, the, the offspring of those animals went on to start every other conservation herd in North America today 
North America today in some way or another. Now, over the course of 120 years now uh, to the year, we've brought back more than 5,000 animals in the park. And, you know, that really is something to take great pause upon. As the population grew, they started to become bison again. They started to become buffalo again. They learned how to migrate. They learned how to move more than 70 miles across the park, you know, moving more, you know, moving back and forth across the land, moving more than a thousand miles in the course of a year for the longest time all within the park. And as the population grew and as they did what bison are supposed to do, which is to move and to shape the land, they eventually started exiting the park. That was in the 1980s. And it created one of the, I don't, I don't know what the right word is, you know, challenging, heartbreaking, life-changing. And they created one of the, the hardest wildlife conservation dilemmas that our generation is facing. You know, and to understand, you know, really what's going on, you know, fast forward to today. There's 400,000 bison in North America, more than 95 percent of those are managed like livestock. You know, they're here to provide food for people in private areas. So the model of bison conservation, you know, it took this left turn right off the bat. You know, one where we manage bison as livestock. If you look at this map, it's a map of the other Department of Interior herds. Today, there's about 11,000 animals in these herds. If they're purple, they're held behind a fence. If they're green, they know how to migrate. Most of the herds are 100 to 500 animals. And this is the best that we've been able to come up with for bringing back the animal that shaped North America. And we don't say this enough. We are trying to figure out, is it even possible to treat bison as a wild animal, as a part of an ecosystem here in Yellowstone? You know, having 5,000 animals, letting them move, letting them respond to predators, that's not being tested anywhere else in the world. It, it's another place where we're trying to lead the world in really what's possible. And my gosh, is it worth it? I've seen it. These animals here provide a reconnection to the past, a reconnection to those long lost herds that you cannot find anywhere else on the planet. Whether it's a five-year-old boy, you know, kind of going out to, uh, and I said that because that happened to be my son, whether I'm taking them out to, uh, you know, see the bison when they're calving, whether it's uh, people from all over the world coming here and just seeing, seeing bison with a capital B, whether it's Native Americans, you know, returning here to see, you know, Yellowstone bison, it's, there's nowhere else in the world where you can see this. We brought back the top dog to this park, the wolf. It was a huge conservation success story. Well, this ecosystem isn't intact, isn't full, until you bring back the other species that evolved to combat that top dog. Finally, now with wolves and bison, you know, ebbing and flowing across this ecosystem, this place is in balance and it's better off for it. Wolves shaping, you know, the numbers of prey, of, of ungulates, of elk, of bison, of pronghorn in the park. Bison changing how the grasses grow and affecting how much food's there for the other ungulates. This place is finally back in balance because, you know, we tried to find a way. And earlier I said, all of those DOI herds, they have a link, a link back to those original animals that were at the Buffalo Ranch. The genetics of this population are unparalleled. More so than anything, they're the only population where if you just let them go today, their genetics would, would live on. They would not decline. 
all of those small herds of 100 to 500 or fewer animals. That's not the case due to inbreeding. More so than that, these animals are still responding to predators. They're still re responding to disease. They know how to move. Their behaviors, you know, what the moms are passing down to their calves, you know, this information, you know, that's, that lives within these animals, genetics and knowledge, you know, needs to get back out to, to bison in North America. But, you know, all of these, all of this success you know, what we're trying to do, something different than's being done every, anywhere else in the world, you know, it comes at a very difficult price. When bison started leaving the park two decades ago, the world wasn't ready for them. It was a little more than two decades ago, but the world wasn't ready for them. There's concerns about disease transmission and movement onto private property being dangerous. So we spent a lot of time you know, a decade developing a shared management plan with the state of Montana and other federal agencies. Over time, over the last 20 years, and I've lived every year of it, we've brought Native Americans into the, uh, the, the group that's here trying to, to manage bison. The bottom line, 20 years and 20 seconds. We drew a box. We said bison can't move much beyond the park. When animals move down, and exited the park, we rounded them up and we mostly sent them to slaughter. We did that to control the population size. We did that, and I say we, meaning multiple federal and state agencies and tribes, trying to find a way to say, there is a way to manage wild bison. Now that 20, those 20 years, I don't know what the right word is, but I'm just gonna say difficult tonight. It was really difficult to live. It was really difficult to do. It was really difficult to see the slow, gradual progress. It was really difficult to see the conflict. But it bought us something. It bought Bison a second chance. It bought us the chance now to ask that question again. Is modern society today now ready for wild Yellowstone Bison? rowing back to the lands where they used to be? I think so. I think there's enough people who think so now. And this talk isn't about the past. This talk is about the future. We're not talking about bison getting off of trailers and going on to slaughterhouse floors. We're talking about bison getting off trailers and reconnecting with Native American tribes, with public lands that need bison, with finding places for them where there is room for them to roam. And we're gonna talk about the Bison Conservation Transfer Program. The bottom line is right now, we still round up animals, some animals when they exit the park. Some of those animals are sent to slaughter. Starting in 2018, that's not the case for all of them. Some of those animals are moved into a quarantine or a, a facility at the park boundary. From there, they move to the Fort Peck Reservation. From the Fort Peck Reservation, they're transferred to the Intertribal Buffalo Council. And from there, the Intertribal Buffalo Council transfers them to more than 58 tribes across multiple states trying to bring back buffalo to Indian country. Just, in, just since 2018, I say just, but I say just because this has not happened in history. 154 Yellowstone bison have been brought back to tribes. 40 of those moved beyond the Fort Peck tribe to 16 tribes in nine states. It was the largest transfer of Yellowstone bison among American Indians in history. Within the next month, 50 more are gonna to move to several across, several tribes across North Dakota. The bottom line is, and Cam mentioned it earlier, bison in this park are endemically infected with brucellosis. 
We know that getting the disease out of bison would have horrific consequences to conservation and to what we've accomplished to date. But brucellosis is heavily regulated in the livestock industry. The fear is then, if Yellowstone bison have brucellosis, there's a chance if you move a live one somewhere else, you could introduce the disease to new areas. And it's heavily regulated in livestock, so much so that the state of Montana has law that says a bison originating from Yellowstone cannot be transferred alive out of the park unless it's first identified as brucellosis free. So the bison conservation transfer program is all about identifying animals as brucellosis free and moving them live out of here. To date, really what we've accomplished, I would say it's been groundbreaking. I think others would say it's been life-changing. Ask somebody at Fort Peck. These pictures are from one of the releases. It doesn't matter what time of day, what time of year the animals get there. You know, members of the tribe are waiting there to welcome them. You know, I think I'm in a few minutes and 10 minutes from now, maybe, I'm gonna show you some video of the, uh, the first direct transfer from the park. We're removing 55 animals over the course of about a week. It was the first day of the move. You know, we met in the park about four in the morning. We started loading the animals on trailers, one at a time into compartments until a trailer had three animals. Then that trailer headed north. And over the course of two hours, seven trailers, you know, started that 500 mile journey up to Fort Peck. You know, I was back at the end of the line, you know, going through the, this was the first time we were putting live Yellowstone bison across the highways of Montana. You know, I needed to make sure we had talked to the state. I needed to make sure that everything was moving. I needed to make sure the vet trucks were traveling with the trailers in case there was an emergency. Now, anyway, I was at the end of the line. And I, I can't tell you how badly I wanted to be there when those trailer doors opened. I can't, you know, I, I only lived 10 years of trying to make quarantine happen. I, I just wanted to be there to see those animals, you know, see a wide open prairie. I, could, I didn't get there in time because of, you know, what I was talking about. And it just made me think, you know, I was kind of prepping this talk, what it probably meant for the people of Fort Peck to see those animals actually get off those trucks. Now, they've been waiting probably a lot longer than the 10 years I was, we've been trying to, to make this happen. Now, I said earlier in this talk, and again, these are photos from Fort Peck. On the left, the 20,000 acres that those animals move in the high plains of Montana. Now on the right, one of the old bulls that was released within the last two years. I said earlier in this talk, we had roughly 20 animals from when there were only 400 survivors left in North America here deep within Yellowstone Park. You know, many, American Indians have told me that those animals are particularly unique, particularly special. They were never taken from their home range. They represent a connection to, to culture that no other bison in North America can represent. So having these animals make that 500 mile journey, it, it really is a, a life changing and groundbreaking event. But we also feel like what we're doing is symbolic. This right now is a shot. It was the fall. Uh, sorry, it was about this time last year, springtime in the park of the Bison Conservation Transfer Program of the quarantine facility. This is at the north boundary of the park. You see two giant pens. There's animals in those. There's roughly 40 animals in each one of those pens. You know, those animals need to live in there the entire time they go through this program. It takes a long time to identify brucellosis free bison. For a bull, that's one and a half to two years. For a female, it's two and a half to three years. That means it takes a lot of space. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. 
And it takes a massive amount of collaboration the whole time along. This has been symbolic to date because since 2018, 204 animals have gone through these pens. At the same time, nearly 1,500 animals were sent to slaughter. This is the August 19th. You're gonna see some video of some of the steps that day to get the animals, you know, this first load of animals up to Fort Peck. That's really hard to think about for me, that this was August of 2019. We're almost two years since we directly transferred bison to Fort Peck tribes. It will be two years this summer. This needs to happen every winter. We need to be able to bring animals into quarantine every winter. This last winter, we didn't have any space to it. The way we do that is by expanding the facility and we're building a partnership with YF, with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, with many of you on this call today. We're going to expand what we have within the park from two to five pens to five pens. We're gonna more than double capacity. We're going to improve the water infrastructure so that the animals you know, can have sufficient water you know, to support these bigger numbers. We're going to continue to revise how we feed and how we treat these animals and how we humanely handle these animals through the process giving them the best chance that they got to get through the program and to get, get a different place to live, to, to roam on a bigger one. This is what I'm talking about. We have the chance within the next five years to move 400, to prevent 460 bison from going to slaughter. We have the chance to move 530 animals to the tribes. I said earlier in this talk that 154 bison, including 40 moved across tribes across North America, was the largest transfer in history. We're gonna multiply that by 10 because we, it's the right thing to do. We're also building this partnership to support education like tonight, outreach like tonight, to support the facility, to support animal care, to build a better future for Yellowstone bison. Making quarantine happen, it took an awful hard lot of work and collaboration between the state of Montana, between the Fort Peck tribes, between Yellowstone National Park, trying to figure out how we do it, where it would happen, what were the testing procedures. You know, we're climbing a mountain here and we reached that first level. Now it's time to find a different set of partners, a set of partners that want to see Yellowstone bison across much larger landscapes. You know, with the conflict and the limitations posed by this ecosystem, it's not going to be bison doing it with their own four feet. It's going to take bison getting on trailers. It's going to take them you know, taking a trailer ride to another place living there for a while, perhaps getting on a trailer again, moving to another place in order to have them have more space to run. You don't want that. Now this effort, as I was saying, takes a lot of great people. You wanna transform what we do with bison? You need transformational people. The photo in the top right of the screen that I'm looking at was taken the last day of that release in August 2019. Front and center, Cam Shawley. Standing a couple of people to his right, Dan Wenk. Standing a couple of people to his left, Robbie Magnet, the herd manager at Fort Peck. Right behind Cam, Chairman Azor, one of the biggest, the chairman of the Fort Peck tribes, one of the great proponents of the program, he shows up every time animals are 
released to the herd. He said to us once that he'd never seen a bison, never, until Yellowstone bison arrived at the Fort Peck tribes. And other people in that image, Shammy, Anderson, Dennis Jorgensen, Daniel Wenner, it's a group of people that are trying to transform what we're doing. And now moving to the future. On the left side of this is Elizabeth Webb. She rode the herds with me last summer in Hayden. That picture's taken for us looking at, you know, calving rates and, you know, how the herd's doing in the central part of the park. She sees that vision. She understands what's possible. I was reflecting on this a few weeks ago, I think, prepping for a different talk. I'm sure it seemed transformational in 1901 when we decided to build fences in the Lamar Valley and start ranching bison. But you know what? That saved the species. It's 120 years later. The bottom line is it's time to build more fences in a different part of the park at the boundary and uh, find a better future for, for these animals. This is gonna clunk for just a second as I um, stop sharing my screen and try and return the host to you, Yellowstone Forever. I think with that, you know, I guess if Cam had anything to say before we go to the Q&A, but uh, Lisa was saying this would be the time to start thinking about your questions, you know, as you to, to Cam. Well, thanks, Chris, and I, I just, I, I think it's great to get to the discussion. I, I do want to reiterate our thanks to all of you for being on. Um, you know, as uh, people who care about Yellowstone, um, I think you can be very, very proud of people like Chris and the teams that work uh, not only in wildlife conservation across the park, but in, in general. And we've taken an approach that uh, we've got to make progress, even if it's slow and even if we have to be patient. And I think that um, we're starting to pick up the pace. And like I said in the beginning, that can't be done by ourselves. That's got to be done in concert with our partners. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot, and Chris mentioned the state, you mentioned uh, the Department of Agriculture, the tribes, um, you know, and the, the nonprofit partners um, and the conservation uh, entities that help us um, are really going to be what's in the public, um, what really moves this for us to a, to a point that's beyond symbolic, which is, it's a really important thing for us to do. And I, I can tell you that um, as Chris's graphic, you know, with the number of bison that we've consigned to slaughter over the last two decades, I fight that personally in myself as the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, uh, that we're consigning bison to slaughter simply because we're not allowing them to transcend the Yellowstone boundary. And that has got to shift. That is a paradigm that cannot work for the future. It'll take some time to change it, but it's got to happen. And if we sit in this box that we've been in for decades and everybody's done a good job in the box to the best degree possible, um, the bison will suffer. And um, we've got to do a much better job of, of breaking that, that those barriers. And um, not only for all the things Chris just lined out about getting them on the larger landscapes, which is one of our top priorities, but even within the immediate proximity of the Yellowstone boundary, within the tolerance zone, uh, within the, the, the designated surveillance area. We've got an ability to help bison move back and forth um, as many of their counterparts do. Uh, and uh, it's, something, it's time for us to get to work and do something new and get serious about it. So with that, I will hand it back to Lisa or whomever's gonna facilitate the Q&A we're, and we're looking forward to a discussion here and answering any questions that you all might have.
Thank you, Cam. Thanks, Chris. Um, we do have some uh, some questions coming in here. Um, the first one comes from Alan in Colorado, uh, uh, asking um, how much of an impact has chronic wasting disease had on any of these any of these plans with the bison? I'm I'm happy to uh, to answer that or at least start the answer because uh, in a former life, my PhD was on chronic wasting disease uh, in Colorado. So I spent a fair share of time understanding how, how those sorts of things play out. And chronic wasting disease is a disease of the, the cervids. It's the animals that have antlers that fall off and people go collect them in, the, in the, this time of the year. It's not a disease of the bovids, which would be bison. So bison are, you know, they, they can't become infected with the disease. Interesting. Um, next question comes from Peggy. Uh, Peggy from California. When, when the bison are transferred, is there a, a minimum number that are sent to any one tribe or area? Um, and, and what is the minimum space to, to receive um, a bison for, you know, a herd that, that could support it. So at this point in the program, we give, we transfer ownership of the property of the animals to the Fort Peck tribes when they step off the trailers at Fort Peck. So they have full jurisdiction, full control, full authority over where they want to send those animals next. You know, as an example of what they did is they transferred 75% of them to the Intertribal Buffalo Council, who then transferred them in groups of one to three to 16 tribes across nine states. Well, that was done because those were, were males and it, they were trying to improve the the herd genetics of all, you know, all of these small Native American bison populations. Now, right now, Fort Peck's taking a different tact. They're trying to move an entire family group of about 50 animals to one place. And I say a family group because you know, these animals, the females are in the program for a long time. They have to calve in the program. Often their calves even calve in the program before they finally get moved. So it's a, it's a family group that's moving to a new place. So the short answer is the tribes hold that control. Interesting. Our next question comes from Doug in Alaska. Um, he asks for the Yellowstone population specifically, given the small starting population, can you speak more to the issue of genetic drift um, and how that may influence current and future management direction. Sure, I can do that very quickly. So for the general audience, genetic drift is the idea that if you don't have a lot of animals breeding together, you can get some, you know, some weird mutations that just shouldn't, wouldn't normally belong if you had a whole lot of bison breeding together. Well, this is the one place where there's actually enough bison to do that, where we're not seeing adverse signs of drift. Typically it takes one to 2000 animals to do that. You know, here we have more than twice that number. Cam, I see you there. Do you wanna say something? If you do, you can unmute yourself. Um, I think you're muted. Well, I think Chris is hitting it well. I think on the CWD, you know, we've got a long way to go in regards to our planning and response. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work with states and our other federal partners in the GYE, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And so uh, that's something that we know is a threat to the ecosystem that is coming. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we've got the right monitoring procedures in place to be able to detect, but also respond effectively and not just alone, but with our partners. I think on the, uh, to, to reiterate some of Chris's, uh, you know, the bison population right now is I think around 5,000 in the park. 
we did not capture any bison this year. And so, uh, you know, we did have uh, uh, bison taken out through tribal hunting, uh, but, uh, you know, we expect that bison population to grow and Chris can give the exact number. I think we'll be somewhere around 55, 5,700 next year in that range. And so, um, you know, Chris has done a lot of work and maybe there's a, a little bit of a, a discussion on a couple of things, Chris. One is the work that you've done about what the Yellowstone ecosystem or the Yellowstone National Park can, can kind of handle. There's, there's a lot of folks out there that on some ends of the spectrum think the bison population needs to be very large and some think it needs to be a lot smaller. I think we're threading the needle right now where we've got a very good, stable, healthy population that's probably going to continue to increase <clears throat> at least maintain a stable level with it we are at now. And then Chris, I also want to make sure that we kind of cover a couple of the details around what expanding the facility means. So uh, you mentioned the, um, you know, the new, the new water system we want to put in to, to get, get water to more animals and also number of pens that we're breaking down and, and kind of building so we can hold the cohorts appropriately as we uh, look to bring in more, more animals in the future. Absolutely. I think that the, the top question I get asked, depending on people's you know, relationship to the, to the story of Yellowstone bison, is how many bison can this park support? Is the park overgrazed? You know, we put an awful, we put an incredible amount of research into understanding the grasslands. And the bottom line is bison are a migratory animal, and they're going to move to find the best foods at the right times. So bison exiting the park is a natural phenomenon that has nothing to do with the park being overgrazed. You know, the work that we're doing supports, we can likely support six to 10,000 animals or well more than that. You know, in, guard, in regards to the, to the facility, we're trying to get to the point where we can hold 200 adult animals at all times. Right now, we're in the 60 to 80 range. We would do that by moving from two to five pens, each pen, you know, roughly 10 acres. That would allow us to put groups of 40 adult animals in each one of these pens. We'd be able to accept groups every year. We'd be able to move groups to the four pack tribes every year. Right now, if you average things out, we accept, we move about 30 animals to the four pack tribes every year on average. We're trying to move that upwards of 80 animals. Right now we accept about a hundred animals into the program over a three year period. We're trying to move that up to 250 animals. You know, other things that would be involved in the act of the actual logistics of the expansion, improving the water infrastructure and improving the handling loadout and testing facility so that we can use the best animal practices so that animals don't get hurt in the process and that we're kind of preparing this wild animal to be tested multiple times, moving from the wildness of Yellowstone into you know, being acclimatized more into uh, the modern world. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, we've had a few uh, questions come in on the topic of brucellosis and you know maybe you know uh if you could expand on you know maybe what a little bit of what brucellosis is how it affects the animals um a couple of questions uh in relation to brucellosis and elk and how that's similar um if you could kind of talk about the, uh, about that topic so brucellosis is a bacterial disease you know it's transmitted when an animal will abort their calf and other animals come and investigate it, you know, when they sniff and lick, which is what I mean by investigate, they can become sick. An animal once it gets sick tends to either just deal with it, you know, and everybody knows with COVID, you know, there's, there's a ton of different ways that a disease can play out in a person or in this case, an animal, you know, or they tend to abort and then recover for the rest of their lives. So bison and elk are both infected in this ecosystem. Bison, due to the, the extreme measures that we've taken, have never been shown to transmit brucellosis to livestock in this area. 
El Cav numerous times because we don't take the same, we take less risk management precautions in doing that. And what I mean by that is we let elk migrate, like Cam said. And then if there's an issue outside of the park, uh, the, the, the state game agency can haze the animals away from the ranch or do some type of depredation. With bison, we've been a lot more risk averse by not letting bison and cows intermix by largely constraining bison to the park. Now that's gonna slowly evolve over time. You know, what we're talking about tonight is a way to make a massive step forward while we, while we continue to work on that. Cam, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I couldn't unmute myself there. Yeah, I think you said that very well. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, um, there's probably a continued need from an education standpoint to separate fact from fiction in relationship to why bison are not allowed to, uh, to transcend the boundary. And that is something that's very noble for us to continue to work on. Um, I think that it's also myopic for us to think about the species in the future as being contained or constrained within the Yellowstone boundary. That just, that, that is not good conservation practice. And when you look at the health of the wolf population that was reintroduced in 1995, there's 120 animals in the park, extremely healthy, an incredible, uh, incredible pup here this year or last year. Um, grizzly bears, we've got over 700 in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, almost 200 in the park. Uh, cougars, you know, native fish restoration. I mean, we're making some massive strides to accelerate uh, our conservation priorities. This is one we've made some good strides in certain areas, um, but we have not reached the potential or where we need to be on it. And so until we can do a better job of not doing this automatic transfer to slaughter, I mean, think about it, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds per year on average going to slaughterhouses. Now, I mean, those bison do get, uh, they're given to tribes. It's, um, after the slaughter process is completed, so, but it's still, it's still, it, sh it should, it should fight um, every thread that we have in relationship to our conservation responsibilities uh, to put wild bison. Someone asked me the other day, uh, you know, are the bison still wild after they've been um, in captivity uh, for several years, going through the protocol? Uh, do they then become more like? livestock and it, I know Chris would echo this what I said to the person is do me a favor uh, go ahead and walk up to some cattle a cow see what happens and why you try walking up to one of these bison even if they've been in the protocol for the last two years and see what happens and you will you will realize very very quickly that while they're temporarily constrained in our facilities they're absolutely still wild. And um, we do, and Chris's team, Chris and his team do a, a great job and the team in the park um, at really trying to maintain that wildness. So they aren't overly dependent and then they can, can be conditioned back into the wild once they're released. Um, but, you know, this is one area and we've got a lot of work to do as a, as a, as a team, all of us, Yellowstone, the public, the partners, um, this is something that we can absolutely make significant progress on, and it has to be a top wildlife conservation priority for us uh, moving forward. What are the questions you have there, Sam? You know, Cam, I think um, I think where we're at on time, and and with that uh, uh, answer that you just had and um, explanation of how important this is, I think uh, I think that kind of wraps up our Q&A and, and I'll, I'll kick it back to Lisa to, uh, to close us out. Thank you guys. All right, thank you, Chris and Cam and Sam for being our uh, moderator uh, and Canon for sponsoring this uh, first virtual Yellowstone event. Uh, I also wanna thank everybody on this call for your support of Yellowstone and Yellowstone Forever and for joining us tonight. If you'd like to learn more about the Bison Conservation and Transfer Program, 
you can click on the link that we just posted in the chat box and that will take you to the program page on our website. Uh, contact us for more information. Uh, we will also email you a recording of tonight's video so you can share it with others or watch it again later. And uh, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.